which can be dismissed at this time. Just follow the grown-ups up to the room. We'll go ahead and start our morning message with a word of prayer and pray for our children as well. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and grace. We thank you for everything Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross for us that through his death, his burial, and resurrection. We can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. We thank you for the special guest today, Father. We thank you for the family. We thank you for the respective ministries that you're using their lives uh, to, uh, for your honor and glory in uh, different uh, aspects of uh, this country and uh, obviously Brazil as well. We pray for word of grace in the ministry there. We pray for uh, friendship, uh, church there as well, and their congregation. And Father, we just, again, look forward to your word uh, and, and today's uh, and, and what you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Let's go ahead and turn your Bibles to Ephesians 5, verse 21. We'll be there today. Um, I did a little switcheroo. I'm a wild card, you could say. Always up to new things, I guess you could say. Uh, either way, we have a special, kind of a busy week. I wouldn't say busy, busy, but it's always been, it's always busy. But uh, Danny, uh, Pastor Danny, is actually um, in town to visit family, but it's kind of twofold, too. Uh, he asked us over a year ago um, to be ordained here as from his local ch- uh, home church. And so the, the leadership board, um, we licensed him, which he's already a pastor anyways. He was licensed to preach, but and how we follow our uh, constitution uh, in the, I call it the green book or the blue book, whatever one you have, uh, there was a procedure and there's a year uh, procedure of uh, basically license, licensing someone as long as they fit the doctrinal statement and agree with it. And then after a full year, then the church, the leadership will go ahead, will we'll, we'll vet him, make sure he hasn't gone woke on us, and uh, in a lot of ways then ordain him, and he'll get a nice little plaque, and it's colored pink anyway, so you'll be fine with that. But in general, um, that's what's going to be happening this week, and I, I foresee him passing with um, full colors, but next week is also Father's Day. And I want to make next week's message a little bit more special in a way for ordination and in a lot of ways um, leadership, respectively. So this week is going to be more uh, in gear towards uh, fathers, uh, something that uh, many of us are fathers. Maybe we have, uh, maybe you're no longer, um, your children are all grown up. Maybe you're a grandfather or uh, whatever the case is, um, you have purpose. So either way. Today's message is uh, respectively for uh, Father's Day, but obviously it always trickles uh, to everybody. Uh, So uh, get in the Word of God here. We'll go ahead and read here uh, Ephesians 5, verse 21. It says, uh, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. I did this message a couple months ago, and I want to share it with you today. It's don't run from it. Steve DeVore, an individual, he built a multi-million dollar company on the principle of role modeling. DeVore is a president of CyberVision, a competent markets instructional video and audio tapes on everything from golf to skiing to weight control. It's not some kind of mystical new age approach to learning, we, we know this all the time, but it's rather a, the master-apprentice relationship put to work in different settings. So it gives a, an illustra- it goes on how he kind of comes about this million, multi-million dollar company. When DeVore was in college, he happened to watch a bowling tournament on television, and I'm not really sure why he watched a bowling tournament on television. But as he paid a close, uh, close attention to the movements of the bowlers, the thought struck him that if he could emulate their movements, he could probably achieve the same results. So after watching the bowlers closely for 30 minutes, he got in his car and drove to the local bowling alley. He got an alley, picked out a ball, and for the next 30 minutes, he, just, he did just as the professional bowlers had done on TV. 
He threw nine straight strikes, recorded a score of 278. His highest score up to that point was 163. By emulating a proficient role model, he improved his performance by 115 pins. But the key was just as. He had to do it just as the pros. Just as he watched and learned from professional bowlers, our culture that we're living in, our families, and our children around us are watching. They watch how we talk, how we walk, how we shop, what we watch, what we listen to, what we read, and what we love. Next week is a special week. It's Father's Day. And one thing most importantly this country needs right now in America, and not just in America, but also in Brazil and other countries, we need, we need men. We need men. We need godly men. And many here are fathers and grandfathers. And if you are not, don't discount your worth... Don't discount your worth to a young child. You see, the Apostle Paul was not the father, biological father of who? Timothy. But we see in 1 Timothy 1 2 on the screen for you, unto Timothy, my own son, in, in what? The faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. He was a spiritual father to Timothy, he was a father figure to him. And we need men to redeem the time because the days are evil. We know this from Ephesians 5, right above, verse 16, what you're already at. Paul tells us that we are to be redeeming the time because the what? The days are evil. The days are evil, folks. One thing Satan wants to do is he wants to take every individual to hell with him. And he tries to deceive every all mankind to think that this world is, it, is all in all. We need faithful men who will lead their families. We need faithful men to lead their friends and neighbors. We need it. But the question is, how are we going to get that? How are men going to do it? Well, I have three basic steps here from this scripture portion today we have in front of us from Ephesians 5, 21 to 25 that's going to show us how you can be a faithful man in a corrupt culture. And first you're going to see submission, you're going to see encouragement, and then you're going to see God. So first step is first importantly, don't run from submission. Romans 12.1 tells us, it's a challenge from the Apostle Paul, it gives the doctrine, all the doctrine we need to know, and 12-16 to 16 is reality, putting your faith in action, and first off, he starts the chapter off here, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, but what, but what? By the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That next verse, I don't have it on there, but we should know it by heart, that we're not to conform to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're to be transformed. We're to read God's Word, to study, to let God's Word uh, affect our lives. And again, it starts with your choice. It's in every individual's choice. Salvation's a choice. It's believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and what? Thou shalt be saved. That's a choice that you have to make. God sent His Son to die on the cross for our sins. He's buried and rose again, and through Him you can have new life. And He says, it's a gift for you. Your choice. Accept it. Just like when walking in the Lord, it's a choice. God wants us to do good things. He wants, to be, wants us to walk in newness of life. But He doesn't take our salvation from us. We're sealed for all eternity. That we're wrapped up in God's love. We're in the Beloved. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. But how do you become, how do you submit? How do we not run from submission? Verse 21 says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. First, you've got to present your bodies in a living cycle. It's a, it's a choice. Second, you have to, how does that happen? Verse 2 says, don't conform to this world. That's why in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet what? Not I, but what? Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. It's dying to self, folks. You have to put 
yourself on the back burner. That in a lot of ways, how are you going to do that? Well, Philippians is a tremendous chapter. Ephesians, Philippians to your right. Philippians chapter 2. It's called putting on the mind of Christ. Putting on the mind of Christ. And that is what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you and I. God thought of us first. You know that? We love Him because what? He loved us first. Okay? He, loves, he loved us first. He came here to die on the cross for our sins. He saw a need of ours and He fulfilled that need. But we have to accept that gift. But Philippians 2, it's a challenge to you and I that we're to put on the mind of Christ. Philippians 2, verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Doesn't mean you don't take care of yourselves. Doesn't mean you, don't, you forget about your hygiene. Doesn't mean you don't feed yourself. But the idea is that the person next to you should mean more. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look, not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And the perfect example is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Philippians continues that. He says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to, be, robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as, as a man, he humbled himself and became what? Obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And he did that for you and I. Putting on the mind of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ is the best example for you and I. Christ submitted to the Father's will. Submission, go back to Ephesians, submission is serving others first. If we want to be strong, we want strong, godly men in our country, in your family, in your own life, you want to be a strong, godly man, it starts with submitting yourself one to another in the fear of God. Submission is serving others first. Our, it means serving our families, friends. And it goes like this. Everything that is convenient for you is out the door. Who likes convenience? Everybody likes convenience. Almost the whole country likes the convenience, right? It's convenient to order things by the apps now, right? You got an app for everything. It's convenient, right? Well, in general, if it's convenient for you, you can say, well, it's okay. But let me just say this. Nine out of ten times, if we say it's convenient, we probably should stop and pray about our decisions. Because when it's convenient, we're thinking about who? Yourself. Okay? This is, this is a good reminder. A good reminder for myself. And, and let me get this out here. We've got to keep continuing to read this passage. Just submitting yourselves one to another. Okay, and then it says where? In the fear of God. And meeting in total reverence that the fact that this is God's order for you and I, that He is God, He is the th high authority. It's out of respect for His sovereignty, His supreme power and authority. Romans eleven thirty three. I love this verse. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways, what? Past finding out. First step to be a godly man, to lead your families, to lead your neighborhood, is to be submit, have submission. So submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. There's three steps in being a faithful man in our culture. First is submission. The second is encouragement. And I love encouragement, right? Words of encouragement. I have a list here. You probably can't even see it on there. Maybe you can a little bit. But it's kind of like you always get lots of encouragement when you're a child in school, right? Lots of encouragement. I just coached a ball game the other day, and I had to give a lot of encouragement because we lost the game after winning by 10 runs. But either way, words of encouragement. But one of them, you're a star student. You're, you shine. You make me smile. We hear the little children here that growing up through school, right? They get stars. They get little stickers. Encouragement. Encouragement. You graduate high school. 
school and all of a sudden you get to college and then all of a sudden then they got to encourage you there and then you graduate, you get to the real world and then you what? No more encouragement for you. Forget it. Grow up, right? Well, we all need encouragement. And, and again, the idea here, verse 22 and 23, look at it with me here. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Men, we are not to be running away from our wives. And the idea here is, it's ideas, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. I want to encourage wives to push your husband and not push them off the hill or off the mountain. First and foremost, I want you to let him lead. God's design. Let him lead. Encourage him to lead. Ask him to lead. Okay? I also want to encourage you that you can pray with or for your husband. Philippians 4, 6. If you or Go ahead and turn there with me. It's right to your right. Pray for your husband. We're to be praying for each other. Pray that your husband takes this role. That takes, that he takes it seriously. That you want him to be that man of God. Philippians 4, 6 tells you, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be what? Made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We're to pray, you're to pray for your husband. And husbands, you're to pray for your wives as well. But at the same time, pray with your husband. Pray with each other. The Pray with your spouse. It's a very special union that you have. You are unified in Christ. Folks, you can pray with each other. Ephesians 4.26, if you already go back to Ephesians. This is why. This is why it's so important. It's something that uh, through marriage you learn to, A, you, you're to pray, have a, your own relationship, but when you're married, you're, you know, you're, you're one in Christ. You're, okay? you, you rep- in a lot of ways, when people see the marriage, they should see who? The Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, unified, right? Okay, well, in general, the, you're to be praying with each other, growing together in, uh, in God, okay? In Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, because I'm going to tell you right now, Satan wants uh, every evil thing to happen with marriage, and he's been doing it since Adam and Eve, by the way. But Ephesians 4, 26, he says, Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither what? Give place to the devil. I always say when a couple's praying together, typically, What? Things may be okay sometimes, right? More cases than some. In a lot of ways, Liz is away right now, but the one thing we put in habit is that I, will, I wake up at 4 in the morning, yeah, and I pray with her before work. And then before she goes, you know, goes to bed because she's worked a long day or something, she calls, and then we have a time of prayer together on the phone. We, we, we incorporated that in our life. Because every season of life is different. So you have to do that with your own, however your life is functioning, how busy you are in different seasons of life. May I have some retired folks that are going on vacation all the time in Florida or whatever in a camper. And you may have some families, you may have uh, missionaries or pastors and you know, things in a house, whatever. Wherever you're at, prayer is so important for the couple, okay? And, and it's the idea that you're, you're, you're in communion with God together. And it's such an encouragement when you pray uh, with each other, okay? It, 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 it's such a very important thing. It also allows, you to, uh, allows God... To lead your marriage. In a lot of ways, our anger, in a lot of ways, our, um, our fleshly nature, uh, it allows. Again, that verse 27 says, neither give place to the devil. Okay, If we allow our flesh to take over, we're giving uh, a devil some playground here to mess around with marriages. And you see that uh, today uh, in, our, in our country. Okay, uh, He's been doing a good job. But in general, wives, I'm asking you, And husbands, don't run from the encouragement, but wives, I want you to push the husbands. Push your husband. Not Again, help him lead. Okay, greatest example, from the beginning. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth, and then he creates what? In day six, he creates the best thing ever, because you should be important about that, because it created what? Man, right? Man, right? Genesis 2, 18 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. Women should be like, yeah! Right? You should be. 
Because that's why you're here. God thought it was important to have women in our, right, special creatures. Men are special too. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet, what? For him. Okay, I want to say this, most importantly. Helper is a title of worth. Okay, this, this thing gets politicized. It gets, it gets a little crazy in the world. And saying that, oh, God doesn't respect women or men don't, you know, again, that's not, it's a, it's a title of war, worth. God refers to himself as a helper, folks. Okay, he says he makes, woman, I want you to be a help me for him, okay? It's of worth, it's a value. You have value. Well, God says he's a helper, to, a helper as well. Our soul waited for the Lord. He is what? Our help and our shield. The Holy Spirit helps us. Who's saved? Who, who accepted Christ as their personal Savior? If you did, you got the Holy Spirit inside of you. Okay? He's indwelt inside of you. And Romans 8, 26 tells what? Likewise, the Spirit what? Also what? Helpeth our infirmities. The word helper is a title of worth. So men, when your wives are trying to help you, speaking to myself, don't run from the encouragement. Your wives want you to lead. Don't run from your wife. Lead your wife the proper way, the way God says. You're the, you're the, you're the head of the household, it says. The head, the head is the head of the wife. Okay? That's what it says. But I want to say this. We often misunderstand or even abuse the biblical concepts of headship and submission. We're to think of, think of headship as stewardship. And a willing choice to sacrificially serve. Okay? Think of submission as a willing choice to support someone's leadership. And the greatest example, I believe, is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and you can turn there on your own time. But in Mark 10, 42 and 45, read what he tells James and, jo James and John. Read what he says and talks about, uh, again, talking about the headship as stewardship and the willing to choice to sacrificially serve. I want you to look at that sometime. But being the head of the household doesn't mean sitting on your throne and asking for some lemonade. It's servanthood, men. That's what it is. It's servanthood. But how do you be a servant? Well, first and foremost, be intentional, right? When you first... Started dating your lovely wife, or maybe you, uh, uh, whatever you you uh, you see um, when you first started doing that, you were intentional, right? I took Liz out onto dates. I was excited to see her. I got off work and I rushed to go see her. Right? I was excited. I have four children now, and we work all the time. That excitement sometimes does not what follow, right? And in a lot of ways, I had to be more intentional in, with my wife. I had to be intentional, plan dates, go on a date, ask her, how can I help? Sometimes they want to hear that. Liz loves when I say, how can I help? I don't like asking the question because she says, go mow the lawn. And I say, I got to do that still. But then ask yourself this, what is it that she keeps asking me to do and I don't? These are areas of how you can be a servant, how you can be intentional. You know, and I get it. I, I honestly do get it. You're tired. You just come from work. Well, she works just like you possibly. Or if she's a stay-at-home mom, she has worked as well. She cleans the house or she takes care of kids. Kids are tough. I got four. But you ask God for strength. And words of advice for all of us men, and even women, if you start feeling cranky, ask God for strength. Your wife is not the enemy. Who is? Satan. Ephesians 6 tells us that we don't fight against flesh and blood, but we fight a spiritual warfare. Okay? Now, women, I want you to encourage your men. Don't beat them up. Don't beat them up. Encourage, meaning help. You're a co-warrior. And at the same time, Encourage everybody here. Encourage young married couples. Encourage those men to be leaders. Encourage them. 
That's what it is. And again, men, I want you to say this as well. Verse 17 tells you what? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Look at verse 19 then. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be what? Swift to hear, slow to speak, and what? Slow to wrath. Your wife is a gift. So listen. It's a gift from God. Don't run from the encouragement. And so there's three steps in being a faithful man in our culture. First and foremost is submission. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Next is encouragement. Being encouraged. Not, not running away when, a, when your wife is trying to encourage you or trying to talk to you. And it's so easy for us men to shut down and just forget about it. It's so easy in a lot of ways to do that. Because I've been there. There are three steps in doing it. The third one is, up, is God. We're not to run from God, folks. You and I as men that are here, people listening, and wives as well, don't run from God. You and I as husbands were given a gift. Genesis 2.23 tells us something here. I don't have it on there. Yeah, I do have it there. There it is. And Adam said, this is his response. When God gave him Eve, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called what? Woman, because she was taken out of man. Adam was given a gift and he took what? Ownership. He loved the woman Eve. He loved her. He loved the gift God gave her. And he took ownership. As men, we are to love the gift that God gave us in front of us, and it's our wives. It, it, we love the gifts of our children. They're gifts. Children are gifts, right? And if you're a grandparent and you have grandkids, that's a special thing. It's a very special thing. They're gifts. We're to take ownership of it. We're not to be ashamed of loving our wives. We're to be unashamed of living a life for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as well. That's the idea, is that we are to not be unashamed of the gospel, right? Because it's the power of God into salvation, to everyone that believeth. But God's given us a gift as our wives, and we're not to be un, you know, ashamed of them. We're to, we're to be proud. We're to be excited. We're to love our wives by nourishing and cherishing her, Ephesians 5, 28 and 29 tells us. But how do you love and cherish your wife? How do you do that? Well, I already said it. We need to continue to pursue her. We need to tell, tell her you love her and show her that you love her. It's very important. These are very practical things that we can do. But they're very practical things that our country tells us not to do. Okay? They're very practical things. And I'm going, to, I'm going to shout this. I've been saying it time and time again. We went here as a, some people from, some couples have went to it. Some, people's have, some couples haven't yet. But I don't care where you're at in your marriage. I encourage you to go to a weekend to remember. I encourage you to do that. It's a tremendous time, one-on-one -on -one with your spouse, to grow together in God's love. It's a great weekend. To, it's a great, great conference. And at the same time, how do you show and tell your wife that you love her? Well, the question I have is, do you know her love language? Do you know her love language? And let alone your wife's language, but if you have children, kids as well have love language. Give you an example. My daughter Ivana is totally different from my daughter Ava. Ava is one-on-one, -on -one. and she doesn't talk to anybody, but when you're one-on-one -on -one with her, she just talks and talks and talks and talks and talks and talks. Where Yvonne is very touch. She loves touch. She loves me sitting beside her, putting my arm around her. She's touch. Everything, every, every kid's different. Every adult is different. If you can't answer the question of what your spouse's love language is, i got a couple books up here, by the way. They're tremendous books. You should get it. It's important to know your spouse's love language. But most importantly, I want you to pray with her. Love your wife by partnering together to impact the next generation. 
partner with your wife to raise your kids and work together to, cre to create an environment for God to shape their heart. We're to teach our children, we're to teach our children together. I love Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is fascinating. I love it. But he's talking to his, Solomon's talking to his sons. But I love this verse. My son, hear the what? The instructions of thy father and forsake what? Not the law of thy, of thy mother. We're teaching our children and raising them together unified. Our culture wants to separate the family unit. They do. It's the husband's responsibility to not let that happen. God's calling, man's driving. It's called redefining success. God's calling through His Word. We have His blueprints on how God wants the man to lead his family. Now you've got to drive it. You've got to take ownership. Submission, accept the encouragement, and don't run from God's Word. Don't run from it all. Raise your children together. Make an impact in this culture. Our culture, our families, and our children around us are watching. They need and want to learn how, how to grow in the Lord. And so I'm asking you, us men, be that guy. Be that dude. Be that man. And don't run from it. And always keep looking up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and grace. We thank you for your word. We thank you for fathers. That was, we can celebrate them next week. Father, I, I pray that all the fathers here and, and the ones I know can take ownership of, of the gift you've given them. But being a father, being a husband, Father, help us lead our families uh, and uh, lead them the way you want us to lead them, not the way the world wants us to lead them. Help us to uh, just, Father, uh, submit to you and your will. And Father, we just pray for... Anybody here who does not know you as their personal Savior, we pray that they uh, see the need for Christ in their life before it is eternally too late. In Jesus' name, amen.